Support comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Republican New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Leader Barclay, as always, because we love having you on, good to have you back with us. Well, thanks for having me on. I love being on. Well, there's a lot to talk about. Let's talk about, you know, old news. Cuomo resigned. Your reaction? Yeah, well, as I, I think I told you before, I wasn't surprised he resigned. I mean, there really was no way forward for him. So I, you know, I thought he'd resign. I didn't think he would do it in the manner he did it. And I didn't think of the timing uh, he did it. And only in New York State, it's really been sort of a strange, I think everybody would agree, uh, impeachment resignation. I don't know if they're never not strange. But the fact that, you know, he resigned but said he's going to continue on governing for two weeks, uh, I think that's pretty unprecedented. And then the fact that the... Uh, Speaker and the Assembly were going to drop the impeachment investigation and not issue a report, but then did a 180-degree turn and are now going to issue a report, which I think is a good thing. So there's been so many twists and turns over the last week, it's hard to keep up with all this. Well, they're going to issue a report, but it does seem that the Speaker wants nothing to do with continuing with the impeachment thing, which I think some Republicans and certainly some of the Democrats who brought all of this up are unhappy with. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I, I guess you could count me as someone's unhappy. I thought we could, we should continue on to actually do the impeachment. If for no other reason, it would supposedly ban him from running for re-election or running for office again, which I think, you know, it's probably unlikely politically that he'd be able to do that. But he does have something like 17 or $18 million in his campaign account. And if he was so inclined, he could probably uh, have some sort of influence if he didn't want to run again. So impeachment, if nothing else, would have served that purpose. But yeah, there's something to be said about moving on, I guess. And again, I think the most important thing is at least issuing a report uh, finishing up the five-month investigation that the Assembly has done, which spent millions of dollars on this investigation, it doesn't seem unreasonable that we get some answers to this. And ultimately, uh, if there's some sort of legislation that we can get out of this report that would prevent any of this stuff from happening, I think uh, is you know well worth it, and we ought to pursue that. So it's a lot of questions that need to be answered, and let's see what comes out uh, this week. I know our members of our Judiciary Committee are able to review the evidence in the testimony uh, that came up through that uh, re uh, investigation. So they're going through that this week, and hopefully we'll have a report uh, sometime soon. Well, Will Barkley, I, I don't wish to give you a hard time, but the idea that uh, we should impeach him so that he can't run for office again does seem mildly undemocratic, I mean, with a small way, right? Right. Right. Other than, um, you know, the wrongdoing, I guess you're correct in saying, will the people ever elect them? But there always are comebacks, potentially, I guess, in, in uh, political politics. But I think it's probably an uphill climb for the governor. But again, as I said, sure. he had seven, I think he's got $17 million in his campaign account. And uh, who knows, in New York, it's a very blue state. And maybe they would forgive him and reelect him. Well, yes. And of course, the big question then becomes... Who will, you know, also be running? Uh, I want to ask you, what are you Republicans up to? <laughs> I, 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 I just, I just can't believe that the choice of so many of the leaders in your party is a guy from Long Island who's a Trumper in Blue State, New York. Well, I, as I've mentioned before, I think it's very uh, positive that we have so many people that are interested in running for governor. I think Lee Zeldin is a good candidate. I mean, almost anybody out of the Republican Party is going to be labeled a Trumper no matter who they are. Uh, so I, I think that label is going to be – you're never going to get around that anyways. But, uh, you know, he's, he's had a lot of success as a congressman and state senator. 
Uh, he certainly knows the state. He's been able to raise money. He's out of, from Long Island. I think that helps him from a geographic standpoint. So I think there's a lot of positives with Lee, and uh, I think he'll be a good candidate. But there are others out there, too. So, you know, we got to get through this and find out who actually can is going to be the Republican candidate. Can you name the others that are out there, and can you tell us what a primary might do to the Republican Party? Would it help it? Would it hurt it? Well, I would have said a primary might have been difficult when um, Cuomo, you know, before he resigned and all these issues came up, just because he looked like he was going to be quite a force, uh, and you'd have to take a year or more to— uh, you know, raise the money and get your profile up just to challenge them. But now that uh, Cuomo is no longer going to be the candidate, you know, the whole Democratic Party is in disarray and who their candidate is going to be, who knows? And, you know, Hochul said she's going to run and she's going to have a difficult time, obviously, being a moderate from upstate. Uh, and so presumably there'll be a number of progressives. I even heard de Blasio is considering running. Uh, so they're, they're in, you know, I would say disarray. So the idea of having a primary on the Republican side is not as problematic as it might have been, you know, just when Cuomo was the only candidate. The only one out there is uh, there's a, the, the Lewis County Sheriff is running, and Car- Carpinelli, I think is his name, and uh, Giuliani's son is also running. So how much does Trump count in, among Republicans in New York State? Well, I don't know what kind of role he would play in this election or what his popularity. I think with, you know, in my area, Trump is very popular. Uh, but if you look probably downstate, certainly not in the city, I don't know what his popularity is on the island. But uh, there are certain parts of the state where he's very popular. But I don't know what kind of role Trump will play uh, in this election. I think really it's about the issues that we're facing in New York State. And there's a lot of big issues, whether it's crime, whether it's the economy, uh, obviously the COVID pandemic and how that's going to be handled. So I think those issues are going to outweigh any kind of, you know, personality problems that people might have had or politics with the former president. So now you got Hochul, who the lieutenant governor, who will be governor for at least a year there, who says she wants to run another time. Is this helpful to the Republicans or does it hurt them? Well, I think it's, you know, again, I think it's helpful for Republicans just because now without the clear standard bearer like Cuomo was, uh, they're in disarray. And, I, you know, it's certainly going to be a divide in their party uh, between, I think, people who view Hochul as moderate versus the progressives in that party. And how that shakes out, uh, I think, will only help, you know, only help Republicans. Do you see a difference between the way the Republicans conduct themselves and the Democrats? I say that in that quite frequently Republicans form a tight circle and, you know, vote as a block, particularly in the Congress. Is that something that is inherent in being a Democrat or a Republican? I guess I don't quite follow. You mean as far as once the Republicans well, make a decision, we all stick together and go with it versus what the Democrats yes. do? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The Democrats fighting with each other all the time. Uh, as we always call it, the circular firing squad. And the Republicans, once they come up with a decision, they go that way. Yeah. You say it from a perspective, and I think I have a different perspective. I think sometimes we do that as Republicans, and I look at the Democrats and I say, you know, they seem to get unified on various issues. But, you know, I, I'd like to think of our party as being a big tent and uh, they're open to different views. And uh, as a result, we got to we have to do that anyways, and we particularly have to do it in New York in order to be successful in New York. But I'm optimistic we can. And I think, again, if we just focus on the issues and not get you know, sidetracked on um, whatever personalities or whatever else that can sink a party, uh, just focus on the issues that are facing New Yorkers. And I know I hear it out there, and I know our conference, the members of our conference are hearing it out there. There's not complicated or mystery, mysterious issues. It's the economy, it's the pandemic, and it's crime. And we, we should just focus on that and offer, you know, solutions. I think we have good solutions, and they're, they're you know, 180 degrees of what the Democrats have been offering. Will Barclay, Assembly Minority Leader, several district attorneys say they'll be following up with their own investigation of Cuomo's behavior, including a potential criminal investigation by the Albany County DA, David Soares, where his office covers the legislature. Should he be given more resources to hold lawmakers in Albany accountable? I say that because I know that the legislature has traditionally under-resourced, if that's a good word, the Albany DA who has so much to look over when it comes to the legislature and the governor. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize it was Albany that was under resourcing the Albany County DA. I mean, he got the obviously the county pays his salary, and uh, I didn't. I don't think 
they choose, we can pick and choose, what, you know, how we run some DAs versus other DAs. But there are a lot, you know, obviously we need ethics reform in Albany. We do have a lot of prosecutorial bodies that overlook the legislature. We have the DA, you got the U.S. Attorney, we have the Legislative Ethics Committee, we have JCOPE, and we have our own ethics committee in the assembly. So there's plenty of prosecutorial bodies overlooking us. But I think ultimately it comes down to legislators doing the right thing. You know, we can, we can't, they say something you can't, you know, legislate good behavior sometimes. And uh, I just wish, you know, my, my colleagues sometimes would, although I think things have gotten better, but in the past, you know, just stop trying to take advantage of everything and start doing what's right for the state and for your constituents and not try to do what's right for you. Just do what's right. That's what my eighth grade math teacher used to tell me. <laughs> Shut up. Just do what's right. But I don't understand something here. You mentioned all of those groups which can investigate the legislature and the government. One of them is called J. Cope. Uh, which other people refer to as Jay Joke, because the governor, this very governor who's in so much trouble right now, got to appoint so many of them. Uh, and believe me, they weren't doing their job. What would you do to change that? Well, I think the, the problem with that is you, you have the governor had control of that, and he had the majority of votes mm-hmm. and didn't get an investigation, particularly of him. You need his he had, <laughs> his appointees had to support that. And obviously, they weren't going to support that. So, you know, one thing I think would bring, and I've always said this about the Legislative Ethics Committee, particularly the Assembly Ethics Committee, if we had equal amount of Republicans and Democrats on the committee, we do happen to have that in the Assembly, but it still controlled the chairman's appointed by the speaker, and they yeah. control any investigation. But if you had a true bipartisan committee, you know, the Republicans want to hold the Democrats accountable. Democrats want to hold Republicans accountable, and that sort of works versus in Albany somehow we seem to have it where the, either governor's controlling it or they want either the majority's control. The, I think it ought to be a completely bipartisan type uh, committee, and each each party ought to have their ability to you know inve- fund the investigation and have investigation done on the other side. That's how they do it, and I'm not saying Congress necessarily is the greatest thing mm-hmm. to always point to, but that's how they do their ethics in the Congressional. I don't know why we don't do the same in the legislature. We're talking to Will yeah. Barclay, a distinguished member of the New York State Assembly, the, the minority leader. What's it been like to have uh, Will Barclay, a Democratic supermajority, so that, you know, as some informed person once said, and I, I don't mean anything negative here. You know, the minority doesn't count for a bucket of warm spit. <laughs> well, I think that's a narrative that's always been played out. Uh, it benefits the majority to push that. It benefits the Democrats to say uh, the Republicans are inconsequential. But it, that's simply not the case. I mean, although we don't have the votes always, uh, we definitely have the soapbox. And we use that, I think, very effectively. And I can point to examples uh, things I don't think necessarily would happen if we didn't uh, play a role in it. Let's just take the governor and the impeachment. I'm, you know, I'm not convinced uh, there would have been any action against this governor if we weren't out there constantly hammering to say we ought to at least investigate him and start the impeachment process. And as a result, look what happened. They came around. just, And then when the speaker and the majority wanted to drop the impeachment process, not issue a report, uh, we, we put it in high gear and said that's not a good idea. And granted, we weren't the only ones pushing that, but we did play a lot of role in that. And I, you know, take bail reform. Bail reform is a perfect example of a policy, ill-informed, I think, policy that was passed. Uh, all of a sudden, we saw crime rates increase, and the result of our conference got out there and said we need to reform bail reform. And we did get some. Some was done in you know last year's budget. So uh, we do play a role. Albeit we have problems with the votes. We just don't have the votes, but we certainly have a voice, and I think we use it very effectively. Will Barclay, what are your chances of bringing it all back? I'm so old, Will, that I remember when the Assembly was Republican, and so was the Senate. That makes me very old. <laughs> well, I was I was alive during that time too, Alan. So I guess that's making me uh, me old also. But uh, so it's difficult in New York State. It's a very blue state. I think some of this is generational. But I, you know, if the Democrats keep pushing these policies that they've been pushing over the last several years. I think you're going to see more and more people uh, come our way. One area where we haven't done well for a whole variety of reasons is suburban women. 
suburban women. And I think because of the increase in crime, uh, because of their concerns about how the COVID pandemic has been managed, I think I'm very optimistic that uh, Republicans can make great gains in the suburbs where we have had in the past been losing voters. Will Barclay, that brings up the dreaded gerrymander. Obviously, they're more Democrats. The Democrats say that they're going to be fair about the way that they redistrict because we have to because the census is now in. Do you have any faith that they're telling the truth? Well, I have past history uh, is any indication I am concerned about that. I think they'll try to use redistricting to benefit themselves as best they can. The only difference this year, as you're aware, there's the Independent Redistricting Commission, um, which hopefully, mm. although I'd say we're the big uh, age, hopefully, uh, will change it and maybe put out some lines that will be fair that the legislature will ultimately adopt, but um, you know, time will tell. But that's the only that would be the big change this year versus years past uh, where maybe I'm more optimistic that uh, we can get political lines that are based on, you know, uh, non-political uh, outcomes or wants. You call me a smile, but I have to tell you, I don't agree. I don't think there's much of a chance that when politicians have the power to redistrict in their own favor, that they will do it. Now, you say that there is an independent redistricting commission. There is. But I'll be honest with you. If I were you, I wouldn't be going around saying there's an independent redistricting commission because I think there's a long way to go before anybody in politics is independent. Well, maybe independent's not the right word. It's just not budget. Yeah. I mean, obviously, legislative puts the appointees on the commission. So whether they're completely independent, who knows? But my my indications from the commissioner on there, and I've heard this from the Democratic, uh, I've heard it from our Republican commissioners about the Democratic commissioners, is they feel fairly strongly that they want to base this redistricting on, um, should I say, on merit, not on uh, politics, but time will tell. And listen, I'm not naive, and I've been around a long time, and I know politics plays a role in everything we do. So, uh, But that's the only difference in years past. It was not, and it was just up to the legislature to decide. I would say, yes, most likely this will, redistricting will be 100% political. Well, politics enters into a great deal here. Is the legislature paid correctly? Do you think they deserve more money? Well, the one thing I feel strongly about, whether we deserve more money or not, I think we're the highest paid legislature maybe in the country. So I, I think that we're paid fairly well. And governor. Uh, but and I, governor. And governor, right. Uh, but I do feel very strongly about part-time legislature. I, I think it's important that we don't have a full-time legislature. Because once you're full-time, that makes everybody so dependent on the, you know, leadership or whatever or keeping their jobs because that's where all their pay comes from. And if you're part-time, you're not so dependent on the legislature. You might take more risk. You might be willing to step away from leadership once in a while. Uh, and that ultimately, hopefully, would lead to better government. The other reason I like part-time, too, is I just think it attracts a more diverse group of uh, legislators uh, than they might not otherwise be willing to give up their other jobs and become full-time legislators. So uh, I think we got to keep it part-time and not worry about how much we're paid as a salary. So I had this guy, Vinny, in my class, Will Barkley, and Vinny, many years ago at New Paltz, and he used to stand up when I'd bring a guest speaker in, and he would say, so is that the way it is? So my question (laughs) is, is it part-time? I mean, they're getting an awful lot of money, and they show up on Monday night, they lose beef on Tuesday. That isn't exactly um, full-time by any means, is it? I think it's a lot put into it. I mean, it's not just, obviously, it's not just when you're in Albany. And I I know some people do it. Some people in our conference do it full time. I think they do a good job. I I think it is a job that you can do part time. Uh, Before I became leader, I was, you know, I would still do, I'm an attorney by trade. I would still practice law. I still practice law, but not, albeit not anywhere near as much as now since I've become leader. So, uh, yeah, I I mean, can you do both? Yes. Definitely. But uh, some people do it full time. And I think you could. it's all what you put into it, I suppose. Now, Will Barclay, your father was a distinguished legislator. You sat at his knee. What did you learn from him? Well, I learned a lot. I think I told you he was in the legislature from 64 to 84. So he was out well before I ever got into it. But I would say he influenced me to want to take on public service. The one thing I think I learned most from him is don't get too caught up in your own thinking, because there are always people out there that have different viewpoints of you. And 
sometimes you have to be open to those viewpoints. And if you get too hard in them thinking your way is the only way, uh, I think it ends up, it's not a successful outcome. So he, I think he taught me most just to be open to other viewpoints. And sometimes you're not always right. He was a good man. I liked him a lot. Yeah, so let me, let me go back to Kathy Hochul, the lieutenant governor. She comes from Niagara County, right? And uh, therefore, that breaks sort of the Democratic unwritten rule, which is you have to, if you're going to run for governor or senator, uh, major these major offices, you should probably come from the five boroughs of New York. This throws all of that into the ash can. Will she survive because of her incumbency? Well, that I would say if she didn't have the incumbency and she just tried to run as lieutenant governor, I think would be very difficult. Uh, to do. We'll see how she governs. What I, I, I was uh, had a nice conversation with her last week. I offered uh, my assistance in any way I could as a minority leader. I said, uh, we're not going to agree, obviously, on much from an ideological standpoint, but I said that doesn't mean we can't work together uh, on various issues to help move the state forward. And she was very receptive to that message. So I think Again, just like a Republican, I advised her when I talked to her, I said, let's focus on the things that New Yorkers are most concerned about. And that's where I think we can get some middle ground. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but with violent crime spiking, there's things that we could do in the state that I don't think are so ideologically charged. And I think they're in everybody's best interest, like continuation of bail reform, like giving judges discretion on whether to uh, be able to um, – give cash bail or not. Uh, those types of things me, strike me as more common sense solutions versus ideological solutions. I think if she focuses on that, she might have a chance to win the Democratic primary. Well, let's talk a little bit about COVID, if we can, uh, leader, Mr. Leader. Uh, the question is masks. Everybody's debating whether people ought to, our children should be masked when they go to school. I can't understand why we don't do that. I mean, my grandchildren are very precious to me, as I'm sure your children. And, and do you have grandchildren? Uh, not, not yet, fortunately. And not, my you, kids are you will. 18 and 19, or 18 and 20, so they're not quite there yet, fortunately. <laughs> you, you, you will. And so um, I want them protected as much as we can. Now, if you wear a mask, you're more protected. It's that simple. So why shouldn't everybody be asked to wear a mask? Well, ultimately, isn't that the question in science? Is that really – does science bear that out, uh, that in schools – you know, the schools necessarily were not a super spreader of COVID. I don't know if people were getting, then, were getting then COVID were, at all. Now we're, now we're we know seeing samples. Yes. Now so we're so I think we ought to follow the science. Mm-hmm. If that's true, and someone can show a study that, they, you know, that's causing or prevents – the spread of COVID, then I, by all means, we ought to, ought to require uh, students to wear masks. But I, I think we got to follow the science. And I think also school districts ought to have some uh, say in the matter, uh, although they need guidance from the state. But, you know, uh, some school districts are a lot different, you know, in some areas versus others where maybe the risk isn't so great and they, the, the, the negatives of trying to wear a mask all day uh, outweigh whatever benefits given. So I think... We definitely need to get input from the school districts. How come you never run for governor? Me? <laughs> yeah, you. I like what I'm doing now. You're, you're I enjoy my job articulate. very much. You're extremely articulate. You're considered. Uh, and, you you know, you make a lot of sense to me. So one wonders now, is it only that the fact that a Republican, well, George Pataki did it, is unlikely to be governor of New York State that keeps you in the job you have? Well, I would never look at it, in all honesty. I, I haven't ever considered running for governor, and who knows what the future holds, but I would never look at it that way. I think the way I would look at it, if the issues or something's out there that would drive me where I think uh, I could be an effective leader and maybe, you know, governor would be that job, then I would I would do it. But uh, I like what I'm doing right now. I like the voice I have. I like the people I work with in the conference. I think we are making a difference. So. Uh, we have a lot of good candidates, and I'm just not inclined to be one of them. So will you take an active role in who the gubernatorial candidate is? Have you done that already? Uh, the leadership seems to be lined up behind Zeldin, but uh, there are those who think he would make a poor candidate. What are you doing? Well, I'll, obviously, I support whoever wins the uh, nomination uh, and the endorsed candidate. He's not even the endorsed candidate yet, although the leadership's behind Lee. And I certainly 
likely a lot. I support, you know, I support him. I, I think he'll be a great governor when he wins. But let's see how things progress, ultimately. Would you have been better off if Cuomo was still the governor and now running? Well, I, you know, I can't put everything in a political perspective. I, I think it is great that he resigned. I think he was no longer could govern. I don't think it was good for the state. We needed to have a change in leadership because of all the uh, scandals surrounding him. So I'm pleased he resigned. If he didn't resign, I thought he ought to be impeached. Uh, whether if he tried to fight this and stay in, I think that probably would have caused a great political divide among Democrats and probably would have benefited the Republicans. But sometimes you can't always look at, through that prism and you know wish that's the case. So I think, again, I think I'm very optimistic about Republicans, and I think the Democrats are going to be in disarray next year. Will Barclay, we love having you on the show. You are a gentleman. I enjoy your remarks. I think that you're able to take a a fair and tough look at every question that I ask, and I think answer reasonably, rather than the same old, same old. So you're welcome back here anytime, and we love having you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. Support comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, uupinfo.org.